All right. Welcome, everyone. This is, like I said, our Fall Science Hub, and today we're going to be talking about lizards, and I think I pretty much say this for every single one, but I'm really excited about this one because um, October holds a special place in my heart. The leaves are changing. Um, we have National Chocolate, National Cheese Curd, and um, National Pretzel Day all in the same month, but also um, in Nebraska, it is Reptile Month. So um, for the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission, we are celebrating October as Nebraska Reptile Month and raising awareness for the amazing reptile species that we have. So what better way to kick off our Science of series than with lizards today, which are reptiles, a type of reptile. So um, just kind of remember, there's a lot of cool events happening as far as um, game and parks and around the state, um, as far as reptiles and celebrating Reptile Month. So um, we will go ahead and get our presentation going on uh, lizards today. And like I mentioned, I don't have a... Uh, co-host with me, but um, I will do my best. Um, I feel like I haven't done a virtual program in a while, so it's kind of hard to remember how to share screens here and let people in. All right, everyone sees my screen, hopefully. So um, like I mentioned, we're gonna be talking lizards today. And uh, some of you I'm sure are looking at this photo like um, that's not a lizard. So lizards come in all shapes and sizes and some of them are even legless lizards, which we will talk about today, but this is in fact a lizard. So um, this is actually one that we have in Nebraska. A lot of people don't know that we have these, but these are called the slender glass lizard. We'll talk all about them later. Um, but just knowing that lizards are not the four legged creatures that we always think of. So, all right, so here we go, Nebraska Science of Lizards. So if you've joined a program before, you know how this goes. If you have questions, please feel free to ask them. Um, go ahead and type them in the chat. There are little breaking points in between um, different topics that we're gonna talk about today, uh, and we'll try to get to them. Otherwise, we do have a question and answer session. Just make sure that your questions and your comments that you're making are relevant to the topic on hand and that we are nice to everyone. Um, otherwise, we do have that right to remove you. And I also want to point out that I am by no means a lizard expert or any expert in anything that I have done on a science of before. I do love science. Um, it is my job to know a lot of information about wildlife, but no one knows everything. So I am no expert. If you ask a question that I cannot answer or don't know, I will find someone that does know that and I will try my best to get back to you. So um, let's go ahead and talk about lizards. So what is a lizard? I'm sure all of us have a lizard in our mind when we think about a picture of one, um, but we do know that lizards are reptiles. So they belong to that order squamata, which is funny because snakes also belong to that as well. So they are in the same exact order. They just have different suborders. So within the lizard realm, there are about 5,000 species um, throughout the world. It is the largest um, and most diverse group of modern reptiles. Um, so there's about 28 families. And as we go through some of them today, you will kind of notice how diverse they are, the sizes, the shapes, the adaptations that they have. Um, but overall, when we talk about a lizard, they are scaly skinned reptiles. So they are distinguished from snakes um, in the fact that most of them, but not all of them fall in this. They have legs, but we just saw one that didn't. So we know that not everything falls in that category. Most of them, but not all, have movable eyelids. Snakes do not have those. And then also external ear openings. Um, but again, there's always exceptions. We have one in Nebraska that doesn't follow this rule. They do not have external ears, um, but neither do snakes. So the idea is that they do distinguish from reptiles uh, or they do distinguish from snakes, um, but there's a lot of if, ands, and buts about that. So like I mentioned, they're a diverse group. They range in size from the smallest gecko, which is 0.8 inches in the world. So very, very tiny, all the way to our 10 foot monitor lizards that are found on the island of Komodo. Um, and then also they range in weight from point 0 0.02 ounces to 330 pounds. So very wide range of sizes, color, shapes, um, and uh, lengths of lizards as well. Um, most of them though are land dwelling, but again, not all of them. We'll talk about some that are not. And also most of them are diurnal. So they mean that means that they come out during the daytime. But again, there's a lot that are uh, nocturnal. So just take everything I say with a, well, there's always an exception. All right, so diversity of lizards. When we talk about lizards, there's several species that are limbless. And we just talked earlier about how that's one of the characteristics usually that it distinguishes them from snakes and the fact that they do have legs. 
Not all of them actually do follow that. Um, we saw we have one in Nebraska, the slender glass lizard. It is legless. So um, they have very, um, some of them have very long hind limbs, which actually enables them to walk um, on two feet like humans, like bipedal. There's one that we'll talk about today that does that. Um, also, when we look at the male lizards, they have a huge variety of this ornamentation on their body. Um, so they have extendable throats or frills or spines, or there's some that have crests on them. Um, so all of those have a purpose and all of them have an adaptation that they use those for. Uh, we also have to talk about the diversity of their habitat. So they range from um, living underground and some of them are completely subterranean, meaning that they live underground their entire life and they hardly ever come above the surface. But there's also some that live on very high elevations. We have one in Nebraska. We don't think of Nebraska as being a rocky elevated state, but we actually do have some points that are higher than Denver, the mile high city. So we have a few lizards or one lizard in particular that um, will like that kind of higher elevation. So, um, but we also know that they are fast, but there are some that move slow. Um, there's some that rely on their camouflage. There's some that are um, venomous. We'll talk about that, not in Nebraska, but we do have some in the world. Um, and so there's just a huge variety of everything you could ever imagine about lizards. It's very diverse. So we know what a lizard is now. Let's talk about some of their, their social, um, their forms and their functions and why do they have and how do they do some of the stuff that other animals do. All right. So one of the things that we talk about with reptiles is that they have scales on them. Well, um, being a reptile, lizards also have scales. So their body is completely covered in them, um, but there's a lot of different kinds of them. Um, a lot of them have like this uh, thick outer layer, um, but they are all made of keratin. So keratin, again, is that just that special protein um, that our hair, our nails, our skin is made of. Um, it's just a specialized form of it when we look at a lizard or a skin snake. Um, so this really helps them prevent that water loss. So amphibians and reptiles get grouped together um, quite often, but the fact is that reptiles and amphibians couldn't be farther away from each other on that evolutionary scale. Um, humans are actually more closely related to frogs than reptiles and amphibians are. So um, one of those things that really separates them is their skin. So um, amphibians really need to be by the water. They start their lives in the water, a lot of them, and then they go on to land. Reptiles have those scaly skin because it helps them protect that water and reduces water loss so they don't have to be by the water. So some of the scales, when you look at um, lizards, they may touch. Um, some of them overlap each other. Some of them are really smooth or some of them are very rigid. Um, when you look at them under a microscope, some of them are what we call keeled. They will have a little ridge running down the middle of them. Snakes also have this. Um, and then also their, um, the way that they move. So their skulls are very kinetic. They're very mobile. Um, so they're able to move their mouth um, in respect to their brain case, but then they're a little limited by their jaws. Um, they don't have this wide open amount of space like a snake will do um, when they um, when they move their stretchy bones and their ligaments to open up their mouth. Lizards can't quite do that. So they're a little limited by what they can eat because of their mouth. Um, but their two halves of their mouth are firmly um, united at the front. And so that limits the amount of food or the size of the food that they can eat. Um, but they also have a very well-developed tongue, which we will talk about. All right, their teeth, they're inside their mouth. So they're usually what we call pleurodont, which just means that they have very elongated roots in their teeth, um, but they're very weakly attached to the jaws. Um, so the bases of those roots are not fused, so they can come out and be replaced throughout the life of that animal. Um, a few lizard families have what we call acrodont teeth. Um, those are just really short and like very firmly attached, which is different than some of the other ones. Um, and like I mentioned, in both of these, the species, the teeth are replaced quite frequently. They lose them, they fall out, they gain new ones. Um, snakes will also do this. Um, they also have external ear openings. As you can see in this photo here, this one with this little black dot right here, um, they don't have external pinna like um, 
humans do, so their ears don't stick out, but they do have external ear openings, most of them. Um, they also usually have movable eyes. Um, they have a well-developed pair of lungs. Um, male lizards also have an intermittent organ um, called hemipenes, which means they have two of them. So very similar to snakes. All right, so how do they move? Again, very diverse on how they do this. Um, there are some surface dwellers, which is a typical lizard that I'm sure most of us think about, um, but there's also a lot of burrowers. Um, there's lizards that actually spend their entire life underground and hardly ever come above the surface. So they don't really need limbs. They're gonna get in the way. Um, and so if we think about these animals, they're gonna be, their limbs are highly reduced or maybe they're even gone. So when we look at that legless lizard, we can make a good assumption that they probably spend a lot of time below ground um, kind of moving through that soil. Um, and then some of those species, when they move, if they don't have legs, they kind of do the side undulation, which is very similar to a snake. Um, or if they have really reduced limbs, they hold them very close to their body. So those reduced limbs are called vestigial. Um, they're very tiny and they're almost useless, but they're still there. So they have a function. Most species of lizards have four legs and five toes on each um, foot. Um, so, so those limbs move in a symmetrical way. Um, so when they sprawl out or move around, it's very similar to other animals that have four legs. We do have some partly aquatic species of lizard. Um, when you look at them, they're gonna be compressed just because of the way that they move through the water. It's gonna help them instead of having these weird legs that kind of dangle. Um, so, that really helps them. For instance, marine iguanas, they have webbed feet. So that's kind of interesting. A lot of other lizards do not have that. There are some tree dwelling species. Um, I'm sure some of you have seen the, the rib um, membranes. Um, so they will actually move their ribs out and they'll have a lot of extra skin and it's almost like a kite. So when they jump from tree to tree, they almost glide kind of like a flying squirrel. And then there's some lizards that have what we call prehensile tail. So that means that they can grip and it's almost like an extra set of hands. Um, the best example that I can give you is like a chameleon. Um, so chameleons have that curly Q tail. So they hold on to trees and then they use their little oven mitt hands to hold on with the rest of their body. All right. So getting back to their tongues and their bodies, um, snakes we know smell with their tongue. Lizards are pretty similar. Um, so all lizards, no matter what they are, they have a very well-developed tongue that is extended for their body. So um, this is how they sense the world. They grab chemicals from their outside. Um, and then very similar to snakes, they have something called the Jacobson's organ. Um, so in snakes, it's the two little spaces where the tongue will come back into their mouth and basically um, under Understand those chemicals that those snakes are picking up. Very similar in lizards, it's a paired cavity where the sometimes the lizards have forked tongues, sometimes they do not, um, but they can smell and taste. So lizards are capable of both of that. Um, like I mentioned, some of those lizards have a forked tongue, which just means that they have a more well-developed Jacobson's organ. So they can sense the world a little bit better than some of those lizards that have just a regular tongue. In geckos, for instance, they do not have a forked tongue, um, but they use it for other circumstances. So they don't have eyelids, so they have to wet and clean their eyelids and they, that's what they use their tongue for. Um, there's an animal in Australia called the great, um, the blue tongue skink, sorry. They have a bright blue tongue and they're huge. They're like this big and people just find them in their gardens. It's not a big deal. Um, so when they find them, they stick out their blue tongue and the idea is that it's supposed to deter predators away or frighten them, um, mostly like predatory mammals or birds that are bigger than them. Um, we have a Great Plains skink in Nebraska, which is a diff just different type of lizard. Um, they use it to lick their eggs. So they want to make sure that their eggs don't get a fungus on them. They keep them clean. And then chameleons, um, classic example of a long tongue lizard, they shoot out that tongue, they grab their food, it's very sticky, and then they pull it back into their body. So very, very different across lots of different types of animals. Remember, we have 5,000 different species of lizards in the world. Odds are you're going to have a lot of diversity between those. All right, so how do lizards keep themselves safe? 
Um, a lot of them are going to use camouflage. This is the most effective thing that they can do to avoid being eaten by a predator. Um, there are certain lizards that have colors and patterns that match their, um, their place that they live. Um, so for instance, in Nebraska, we don't have a lot of brightly colored lizards because um, our vegetation or our plants or our soil, they need to blend in because they're rather small. Um, chameleons, for instance, we all know that they can change color in as little as 20 seconds. Um, so basically they just move and then they expand the amount of pigment in their skin. Um, it's not similar to, there's a couple of painting commercials, like if they touch blue, they'll be blue. If they touch purple, they'll be purple. It's not quite that diverse, but they can turn dark. They can turn lighter. They can turn green. It just depends on the species and where they're found. Um, but we also have things that um, don't have a lot of pretty colors, but they have other things that keep them safe. So a lot of lizards will hiss, especially the larger ones. Um, so blue tongue skinks, I said, that live in Australia. Um, beaded lizards actually live kind of in the southwest part of the United States. They will hiss a lot. Um, this one is one of my favorites because it kind of makes me think of Jurassic Park a little bit. Um, but these guys are those frilled lizards. Um, so when they get scared, they puff up the fan around their head. Um, and that's what they use to startle a predator. They use that really big, loose collar of skin. And then our monitor lizards, they get rather large, um, but they have huge, powerful tails. Um, I remember one time our professor brought in a monitor and he's like, don't worry about the mouth, worry about the tail. And I was like, come on, it's a tail. And you get whapped by those things and they really hurt. So um, they have powerful hind limbs that they can climb, they can run, they can um, uh, walk on, they can walk on water, some of them. Um, so it just kind of depends on what they're used for. Um, so some of them will escape by climbing trees. A lot of lizards just scurry. So in Nebraska, if we see a lizard on the ground, odds are you're going to see it for about half a second and then it's gone. It's going to scurry under a log or a piece of vegetation or a rock, something like that. And then a lot of things that lizards do, if they don't have any of these things, they're just out when the predators are not. So if the predators are out during the daytime, they're going to be nocturnal. So it's a smart decision because you're out when your predators are least likely to be there. Um, there are some lizards that play dead and then there's there's um, some species. We have a western horned, short horned lizard in Nebraska um, that does not do this, but they're in the same family. Um, horned lizards will actually squirt blood out of their eyes to deter predators from touching them or looking at them. And again, if you're a person and you see this, it's kind of freaky. So, um, but again, the one that we have in Nebraska does not do this, but they're just cousins to the ones that do. All right. Um, another thing that I think a lot of us probably know, um, lizards have what's called an expendable tail. So some of them do this, not every single one. Um, we call it autotomy. Um, so, so these guys, they have very, basically a voluntary tail loss. So it sucks to lose your tail, I cannot imagine, um, but it's better than being eaten by a predator. So, or having a, a worse injury um, to your face or your head or something like that. So um, there's a lot of animals that can do this on point. Um, so when they're confronted by a predator, um, a lizard will often just drop its tail. Um, some of them will actually move it um, really quickly like a worm, and then it distracts the predator, they drop it, and then they run away. So uh, pretty good strategy. Um, it occurs in most uh, lizards, but things like monitors cannot do this, chameleons cannot do this. Um, most of the ones in Nebraska can. So basically they have um, vertebrae within this tail that are connected and there's connective tissue that's um, attaches at weaker points um, and the blood vessels. So when they do drop their tail, it's not a huge deal. Um, they can most of the time grow it back. Um, however, when it does grow back, it's never the same as the original. Sometimes the color and the pattern don't match up. Um, sometimes it won't grow as long. Um, and we also have to think about this is super costly for those animals. So this is a very expensive thing that they have to do to grow a whole new tail. Um, and it does also depends on where they live. Uh, lizards will store their fat um, in the tail. So if food is scarce, you just lost all your food source if you drop your tail. Um, for females, it, it really is hard uh, because this is where they store all of their um, uh, fat for their yolk production in their eggs. So if they 
lay eggs and they're still trying to grow their tail, their offspring might have a little less of a chance of survival because they're missing some of those key ingredients in that egg. Um, there are some lizards that also have what's called regional integumentary loss. So integument is just your skin. So basically they can just take their skin off. Um, things like geckos and a few skinks can do this. Um, there are reports of some uh, lizards doing this, losing up to 40% of their skin. So just think about it, like almost half of your body skin is just gone. So it's super costly, but we also have to think about it's either you lose your tail and your food source or you die. So um, it, it just, it's a trade-off. All right, so here it's a little bit different in juveniles versus adults. So when we look at the length of the tail, you have all these different sections. Um, so in the juvenile, there's going to be um, these little breaking points right here that they can just let go. Their body just understands to let go. They break off. Um, and in the adult, it's a little bit more um, already set. Um, your growth pattern is pretty much done. You're still, you're done growing. Um, but there's certain areas still um, that are a little bit more um, um, less and weaker so that they can just drop their tail at those certain points. All right, so feeding behavior. What are we talking about when our lizards eat? So many of our lizards are predators. So that means that they eat their smaller prey. Um, so they feed mostly on insects and sometimes terrestrial invertebrates or land vertebrates. Um, it just depends on the species and where they're located. Um, larger lizards, things like monitors, they'll eat mammals, birds, sometimes other reptiles. Um, the largest lizard, the Komodo dragon, will eat water buffalo and goats, um, so fairly large prey. Um, only 2% though of known species of lizards are herbivorous. So 98% um, of them are gonna be predators. Those 2% are gonna known um, to eat things like um, plant material or they'll eat algae like the marine iguana which we will talk about later, but um, they're one of the only lizards that spends time in the ocean and that they eat the saltwater algae off the plant, off the rocks in the bottom. Uh, lizards that will eat things like leaves and stems, um, they have special gut bacteria uh, and structures that are able to break that down. Um, it's very similar to like a cow or um, a large ruminant that eats a lot of plant materials. Uh, they do not regurgitate it, but they have special systems in their body that are able to break that cellulose down. So lots of geckos will do this. Some skinks will do this. Um, and then some of them will also supplement their diet depending on the time of year, depending on if food is scarce. Um, so sometimes if there's a lot of fruit available, they'll eat fruit. If there's not a lot of fruit, they'll switch to insects. So it could be seasonal. Um, it's also way easier to digest those things than it is cellulose or that plant material. And like I mentioned, some of them will also switch, not just with the season, but with maturity. So when they're younger, they might have a more high protein diet. And then when they get a little bit older, they might switch to things like plant material or fruit. All right, so social behavior. We don't necessarily think of lizards as a super social um, group of animals, um, but obviously they have ways to communicate with each other. Um, some of them spend time in groups, um, but many user, lizards um, will sometimes defend territory. So they have threat displays, um, both to their own species and other species as well, saying, hey, this is my territory. This is my house. This is where my girls are gonna be. Um, so that's what they're worried about. They'll do things like color changes. They have body inflation. They'll do push-ups. Um, we went to Puerto Rico, and if anyone is familiar with Dennis Ferraro, he uh, uh, will stand next to, there's a, an island with these Cuban rock iguanas, which are endemic or only found in that area. And they're, they're fairly large iguanas, um, and he would get down and actually do push-ups to them, and they would do push-ups back to him. Um, so it's just a way to display that aggressiveness or um, even in that territory as well. So um, they'll do jaw gaping. They'll literally just hold their jaw open, they'll wave their tail. Um, some species will have specific head movements. So if you see a lizard sometime in a zoo that looks like it has kind of like this robotic head um, and there's another lizard in there, there's species specific head movements that mean certain things to certain species. So 
Um, also, when we talk about, especially males, um, holding a territory is super beneficial because you get the best girls, you get the best area, you get the best time of year, time of day, but it's also super costly for them. Um, if you're out there and you're displaying your um, push-ups to your girl or you're sitting there for a long time, um, it's like waving a flag to a predator and being like, hey, I'm not moving, come down and eat me. Um, and you're repeatedly doing this for a long periods of time, um, you're more likely to get taken or eaten by a predator. So it's not uncommon that males often get eaten more than female lizards. Um, there's also some combating that happens between lizards. Um, if you ever have watched YouTube videos like of the really large monitor lizards, they will fight with each other. They'll like it looks like they're hugging each other, but they're not there. That's how they fight. They'll whip their tails at each other. Um, basically, they're doing that to defend that territory or even sometimes a specific mate. Um, also, bigger males will hold bigger and better territories, um, and they'll also mate more frequently than um, smaller males or younger males. Um, hatchlings, one thing that I kind of learned from this doing this is that hatchlings and sometimes juvenile species, um, they will time the, the specific time that they pop out of an egg to also go at the same time as a brother or sister. And so they will travel together because you have two sets of eyes now and another person to help you and safety in numbers. Um, so it it's a social thing that they do. So they will time each other's egg um, breaking out and then they will go with each other. So it might be a small group, it might just be one or it could be just a couple um, together. So it just depends on the species. All right, so another thing about their social behavior, um, it also involves some chemicals. So smelling, those pheromones sometimes, um, their skin does not have mucus glands, or um, but they do have other types of glands that are found throughout the body. Um, so they're under surfaces of their thighs. These are called your femoral glands. Um, their cloaca, which is the opening where they um, their digestive tract ends, their urinary tract ends, um, and their reproductive tract ends, um, they have these things called pleocloacal glands. Usually they're larger in reproductive mature males than they are in um, younger males or even females. Um, but basically these secretions they think are used to attract females and to kind of mark their territory. So um, lizards are the ones that can smell them. They use their tongue um, and bring those chemicals and scents into their mouth. Um, and then some lizards in females will have these too, but mostly it's the males. And then another thing that we uh, always see lizards do, we always see reptiles and turtles do this too, um, but they bask or they voluntary, voluntarily expose themselves to the sun. Um, they do this because they are in fact um, ectotherms, which means they're cold-blooded. They do not keep their um, internal body temperature at a certain uh, temp all the time like mammals do. They just can't do it. So they need to get that heat from somewhere else. So um, they will voluntarily lay out in the sun on a hot rock, um, on the concrete, whatever they can find that's warm to absorb that uh, heat. Nocturnal lizards sometimes have an issue doing this because there is no sun out during the nighttime. So, um, or burrowing species will do this, but they will directly obtain heat from other substrates or other surfaces. So um, sometimes the lizards that are completely underground all the time, um, during the cold part of the day, they will burrow up closer to the top where the sun can penetrate through that soil and it's warmer up there. If they get too hot, they will start to burrow underneath. Uh, the strategy is known as they go, they go marry. So, all right. And then, so talking about reproduction. So um, a few lizards in several families throughout the world are unisexual. So they one sex per species. Some of you might be like, how does this work? Um, they can reproduce through parthenogenesis. So um, a way for them to uh, they don't need a partner to reproduce. Um, some species, um, both there's male and female, like other animals, um, that copulation and that fertilization is then done internally. So male and female, they will do it and they will do it internally. There also is external fertilization. Um, males will often use what's called their hemipene. So that means there's two of them. Um, they will use this. They usually use one of them um, until that sperm is depleted. And then they will go about using the other one. Uh, fertilization of one or more eggs usually incurs in the female's oviducts. Um, 
some species like chameleons, for instance, um, they can store the sperm for later on um, and use it. So it's really hard sometimes to establish that paternity of which male is the father for all of these. Sometimes it's he's the father for this one. And then this father is the, these two. Um, so it just, the sperm gets mixed together and then the female can readily use it as she pleases or when the environmental conditions are right. Um, some species of females, when they are ready to lay eggs, they might lay them under rocks or in humid soils. Some of them, like I mentioned, will retain those eggs until the embryos are well-developed um, and then have live birth, actually. Um, we have one in Nebraska that does that. And then the lizard placenta is critical for nutrients because unlike mammals, reptiles do not get anything from the yolk or the shell. They break out and they're ready to go. So they have to use that placenta as a way to get that nutrients. All right. Um, it really depends on the number of eggs. Uh, determines whether if it's a larger lizard, if it's a smaller lizard, where they're located. Usually the general rule is that the larger the lizard, the more eggs they can lay. Um, sometimes lizards only lay one egg and that is it. Sometimes it's one or two. Monitors, those really large lizards, they could be up to 50 per clutch. Again, it just depends. Um, most lizards, just like other reptiles, they don't really have a lot of maternal care. They lay their eggs, they leave, good luck to their offspring. Um, not all species do this though. Some species will guard their eggs for a while until they're ready to hatch and then they leave. Um, some actually will stay and brood the entire time. Um, they rotate their eggs to make sure they're getting enough warmth, enough moisture. Um, the Great Plains skink, which we have here in Nebraska, they sometimes even will assist the hatchlings um, and then defend them from predators. And then once they're kind of out of the eggs, they're good to go on their own. Uh, some lizards also depends on when they um, reproduce. Some of them will do it annually. Some reproduce depending on the season or the amount of rainfall. It also depends on your climate, your humidity, the food availability, and even the light cycle. So um, like ours in Nebraska, they usually do them at the beginning of the year. They hatch and then they go into hibernation or brumation. So, um, but again, it just depends on the season and the climate and where they're located. All right, so that was a lot of information, just like we barely scratched the surface on lizards here, but just giving you a little idea of how they move, what they do, um, the diversity of lizards that we have uh, in the world. And then we're gonna go ahead and talk about um, different types of lizard species in Nebraska. And then I always like to end on just a few that are not in Nebraska, just because it's interesting. So, all right, here we go. Nebraska lizard species. Um, Western slender glass lizard is one that is super unique because it doesn't have legs. It's the only one that looks like a snake. Um, these guys are really good burrowers. Um, how they get their name is that they do have that um, ability to let their tail go. Um, and when they do that, it often breaks into multiple pieces like glass. So that's how they get their name, the glass lizard. Um, these guys are not very common. We only have records of them in a few counties in Nebraska. Um, they're hard to find because they are so unique. A lot of people think they're snakes, um, but they're found in those arid grasslands and they really like those loose soils. Um, these guys, we think, only reproduce every two years. So that might also why we don't have a ton of them in Nebraska, just because they only reproduce every two years. So if you see one, let us know. We would love to know. All right, the lesser earless lizard is a small lizard that we have in Nebraska. It looks like a normal lizard. It has legs, it has toes on it, it has external ear openings. Um, actually, sorry, this one is the one that lacks the external ear openings, but it does have good hearing. Um, there's nothing really special with the, the colors on or the patterns, but that's what they want. They want to blend into their um, surroundings. So those sandy soils with very little vegetation, they found on these guys that if the amount of plants tends to increase, the lizard population will decrease. They just don't like plants for some reason. Um, they feed on insects and spiders. Um, these guys are mostly found in the western like two-thirds of Nebraska and they're diurnal. So I mean they come out during the daytime. 
All right, here's the one in Nebraska that lives way out in the panhandle. Um, these are related to the species that can shoot blood out of their eyes. These guys cannot, but they're related to the ones that can. They're pretty much the most easy identifiable one because they look like this. Um, oftentimes people have called them a horned toad. It's um, very common to hear that, but it's very incorrect. They are not a toad. They are in fact a lizard species. So they have the modified spikes um, or the keratin scales on them. They're very heat tolerant because they live out in the western part of Nebraska. They like those sandy soils and very small amounts of vegetation, uh, but they are insectivores. They like things like grasshoppers and ants. Um, like I said, these guys give birth to live offspring. They do not lay eggs. They're the only ones in Nebraska that do that. All right, and then the prairie lizard. This is probably one of the most common lizards that you're going to find. They're pretty much found west of about Kearney or so, the western two-thirds of Nebraska, but they have a very rough looking um, scales on them, um, so they overlap, and they're also keeled, which means that if you take a small little scale from them, you put it under a microscope, you will see a ridge running down their body, um, so when you would touch them, they're very rough. Um, they have these lighter color stripes on them. And one thing that we have found about these is that they're usually always associated with yucca plants. We don't know why, but they really like yuccas. So if you see yuccas, the more likely you are to see a prairie lizard. Um, they're pretty voracious predators. They will eat anything they can catch. And males of the species during their breeding season, like many of our species that we have in Nebraska, they have bright blue patches underneath their, um, either their throat or underneath like their armpit area. All right, I think the one next to it is, uh, I mean, they look very similar here. The sagebrush lizard, the prairie lizard, um, they look very similar. The only difference is the sagebrush lizard is only found in just a few counties throughout Nebraska. These are the ones that like that little bit higher of an elevation. So we don't see them very often, um, but again, they have those blue patches. You can kind of see underneath their belly right here. Um, they have the blue underneath them. Um, they're often these rock dwelling species, um, but they also like area with gravel and sandy soils. And like their name suggests, they like sagebrush. So sagebrush lizards. Um, these guys with a little bit higher of an elevation in Nebraska and not in Nebraska, their breeding may be delayed just because of the temperature. So usually um, a lot of our animals, when they come out, they find a mate, they uh, lay eggs, they hatch. These guys, it's a little delayed just because it's cooler temperatures, higher up in elevation. All right, we also have some skinks in Nebraska. So we have the five line skink, um, which technically is supposed to have about five lines, but um, never usually does. Um, they're normally jet black. Uh, the young are normally jet black. And then as they get older, they develop those stripes. Um, the older males then tend to lose the stripes as they get older, um, but they like moist woodlands and grassland areas. Um, their eggs are actually laid in rotting tree stumps or um, rotting logs. The females will stay with the eggs until they hatch. And they're found in just a few areas in Nebraska um, that are in like that extreme Southeast area. Um, this one is kind of hard to tell, um, but these guys during breeding season, the males will develop kind of a reddish orange head on them. Um, and that's how you know that they're males. And then we have the many lined skink. So they have many lines that alternate down their body. Um, these guys are very smooth when you touch them. Um, and this one you can actually tell has lost its tail before because the patterns are very different. Um, so this one's grown its tail back. The scales are smooth and glossy. The tail are easily broken on these guys, um, but they do have the red lip pigment scales. Um, the males will develop uh, during breeding season. These ones um, feed on insects and arthropods. Um, and when the hatchlings come out, they are colored black, that they have vague hints of a bright blue tail on them. So that's how we know that they're hatchlings. And then the largest one, these guys get up to about 13 inches. So think of a ruler and add an inch. Um, the color is normally like brown or gray. Um, other skinks have parallel rolls of scales. These guys have diagonal rows. Um, 
The hatchlings are also black with bright blue tails, but sometimes they have that orange spotting on the heads. Um, again, the males will require um, or acquire a red or an orange head on their head and necks and forelimbs during breeding season. These guys are pretty cold tolerant. So they're found on the eastern side of Nebraska um, and it gets fairly cold um, in the spring and in the fall. And they're usually out a little bit longer. These guys being so large, 13 inches, um, they're pretty aggressive when you grab them. They bite and they are strong enough jaws that they can actually like break your skin and draw blood. Um, so if you see one, leave it on the ground. They're cool to look at, um, but probably not to touch. All right, and then we also have the Northern Prairie Skink, um, about five to eight inches. They have um, the chin and neck of the males is gonna be a bright reddish color during that breeding season. They like sandy or loamy soils. Um, they're always usually found next to a water component. So a pond, a lake, a creek, something like that. Um, these are the ones where the females will lay the eggs and then she'll continuously tend to them. Um, so she'll turn them over. She'll make sure that they don't develop any fungus. Um, if one of them starts to develop a fungus, she will eat it so that the other eggs don't become infected. Um, and then these guys, the adults, are often known to cannibalize other young northern prairie skinks. I don't know if for some reason it's just these, but not the others. All right, and then we have a six-lined race runner. So like their name suggests, they are fast. They have commonly about seven, actually, they lie, it's false advertising here, not six, but seven stripes running down their body. Um, they're usually pretty bright green in color. Um, males are gonna be a little bit more blue-green during the breeding season. Um, their tail is super long. So if you ever see one of these guys with a super long tail, um, it's about two thirds of their body length. They're found in arid grasslands with sandy soils. Um, they're diurnal um, and they're active even during extreme heat. So they kind of fill that niche that a lot of other um, lizards do not in Nebraska. Um, and then the hatchlings look similar to adults, but they're gonna have again, those bright blue tails. All right, so those are the species that we have in Nebraska. We have 10 species of lizards, um, 48 species of reptiles total, 10 of those are lizards. So I really quickly wanna go through about, I think five or six different um, really unique world lizard species. Again, these are not ones that we have in Nebraska, but I think they're very interesting and they have some cool adaptations. And then if you have any questions, we will do a question thing at the end and then we will already be done for today. So, all right. So one of the coolest ones, um, probably not going to win any contests for being the, the prettiest or the loveliest, um, Charles Darwin himself even described these lizards as hideous looking and the most disgusting, clumsy lizards. But no offense to Charles Darwin, but these guys are super cool. They're founded only on the Galapagos Islands. Um, so every island is its own special little ecosystem. And same thing, the marine iguanas, every um, iguana species that's found on the island is different from each other. So what they make up, um, what they lack in their looks, they make up in other really cool ecological adaptations. These guys are the only lizard in the or only lizard in the world that spends time in the ocean. So, and they're also herbivores. So they eat the algae um, at the bottom underwater, and they eat seaweed as well. Well, when you think about it, if you're in the ocean and you're eating a lot of seaweed and a lot of um, algae, you're going to acquire a lot of salt in your body. So these guys will sneeze it out. Um, so after eating a bunch of it, it collects in their body and then they will literally just remove the salt by sneezing it out. They can also shrink their bodies. Um, if there's a lot, um, if for instance, it's an El Nino year, there's not a lot of food availability, their entire body can shrink uh, up to 20% to um, reduce that amount of food availability. So everything will shrink. And then hopefully when that is, kind of nearing to be done, they are able to eat food and kind of come back to that normal body size. And they can also dive more than about 65 feet underwater, which is pretty impressive for a lizard. All right, Komodo dragons. Um, these guys are probably 
one of the most well-known lizards. They're very, very large. These are one of the, lar the largest living lizard, heaviest lizard on earth. Um, usually get up to about nine, 10 feet, 330 pounds. They're very large monitor lizards. Um, they live in Indonesia's lesser islands. They have a special island even called Komodo Island where you can go see them. Um, they can walk up to seven miles a day. And when you're a 330 pound lizard and you're walking like with this undulating body, that's impressive, seven miles. Um, females, when they're ready to mate, they will actually leave a special pheromone in their poop. Um, and that will let males know that they're ready to mate. Um, larger monitor lizards, they lay more eggs, um, about 30 eggs um, when they clutch them. And it takes about eight months for them to incubate and hatch. That's a long time. Um, females also can reproduce asexually. So they don't need males to do this. The only issue is that when they do reproduce, they only produce males, which is fine. You're still reproducing and you're passing on your genes. But at the same time, those males then cannot, um, they cannot reproduce asexually. They will have to go find a female. So if you have a time when a lot of um, females are reproducing asexually, you're going to have a lot of males. Not many male, not many females out there. So there's going to be a lot of competition. There's going to be a lot of fighting, um, and there's also going to be a lot of um, periods of time when they're not um, reproducing and not reproducing um, new genetic sequences. Um, they also will eat pretty much anything: um, carrion, deer, pigs, small dragons, um, even large water buffalo. They can eat 80% of their weight in one feeding. So think about that: 330 pounds whatever 80% of that is, they can eat that in one sitting. Um, these guys also have venom glands, so they're not the fastest lizards in the world, um, but they bite and they have almost like a tear um, in the body of whatever they bite. Um, we used to think that they had bacteria that's actually been disproven. They're, they are venom, venom glands. Um, it lowers the blood pressure of the animal. Um, they think that they're lucky because they got away with just a scratch on them, but then later they will die and the Komodo dragon will go find them. Um, I have to tell the story about Komodo dragons. When I was in uh, third grade, my teacher, I don't think she's on today, my teacher, um, we had to do a project about animals and being the nerd that I was, I was like, I want to do one on Komodo dragons. So we had to go around the room and say what animal you wanted to do. And out loud, I said, I want to, I want to research a Komodo dragon. And she looked at me and she goes, let's pick an animal that actually exists. So do not let anyone out there tell you that Komodo dragons aren't real because they are. So my mom, I think she's on, she helped me cut out the piece of paper um, that talked about the new, I think it was in Denver, they opened a new um, zoo with a bunch of Komodo dragons. And I like cut it out and I sent it to her and say they do exist. So don't let anyone tell you that they do not exist. So they do. All right. Worm lizards. These guys are completely subterranean, which means that they always are underground. They have no limbs. They're found in places like South Africa, South America. Um, they are true burrowing lizards. So with that, they have to have a ton of unique adaptations. Um, they form funnels or sorry, tunnels with their body by forcing their head around things and basically swimming through the soil. So they have thicker skulls. They have fused eyelids so they don't get dirt in their eyes. They do not have external ear openings because you don't want dirt in your ears. Their nostrils point backwards. So again, you don't get dirt in them. And then their ears are highly specialized for listening to vibrations. Um, also, how they feed is quite terrifying. When they find something, they bite into it. And then they all of a sudden, they move backwards really fast. And they drag their prey along the tunnels. And they rip off pieces as they go. So arthropods, worms, sometimes small vertebrates if they find them. Um, but these guys do reproduce with internal fertilization. So they have to go find a mate. And they reproduce internally. All right, this one's fairly common. It's again, common basilisk here, but it's just their, their cool adaptations. Sometimes people call them the uh, Jesus lizard because they have the ability to walk on water. So um, they're very abundant in the tropical rainforest, um, Central America. Uh, they spend a lot of their time in trees, um, but they always are close to water. Uh, so if they're in a tree and a predator approaches them or they get terrified or scared, they will literally just drop into the water um, and then 
then they'll stand upright and they'll run about five miles per hour just across the surface of the water. They have extremely long toes with fringes on their skin. Um, so basically it increases the surface area. They slap their feet with the water. So they create these tiny air pockets that keep them from sinking. And they can do this for about 15 feet. So um, when it finally ends and they sink into the water, they're very good swimmers. Also, they're one of those 2% of um, almost, in, uh, almost uh, herbivorous uh, lizards. They eat plant material, but they will also switch sometimes to insects, fruits, and even small vertebrate animals as well. All right, this is, it was hard to pick a chameleon, but the Parsons chameleon is the largest one. It can get up to 27 inches. So little over two feet, huge chameleon species. Um, they are endemic, which means they are only found uh, natively to isolated pockets of Madagascar. Um, only issue is that these guys are highly poached because of the pet trade. Uh, people, A lot of people want chameleons being so large, they're very unique, um, but they have these kind of like Pinocchio-like nasal appendages. They also have bright orange eyes. So the upper and the lower eyelids are joined together and they can move independently from each other. So they have a 360 view of everything that they see. Uh, females, they will incubate eggs for a year. So they can bury, they'll found in the trees. They spend a majority of their life in the trees, but females will go down to the ground to lay her eggs underground. They lay about 20 to 60 eggs and they will sit there and incubate for a year long. So it's no wonder these guys are, um, they're not endangered, but they're very close. There's not a ton of them left. Um, they can also change color um, by basically employing these specialized pigment cells called melanophores, um, which basically controls the amount of light that gets reflected. So if they get scared, they can change color to kind of a darker color. If they're happy and they're chilling out, they might be a brighter color, um, but still very cool animals. And again, the best thing about chameleons is their cute little oven mitt hands. All right, this one's called the thorny devil. Um, this is literally their common name, this thorny devil. Um, their common name is cool, but their Latin name is Horridus. So still very neat. They're very slow moving. And if you get a chance, go on YouTube. They will like kind of bob their heads and go back and forth really slowly. Um, they're very slow moving. They look very intimidating, but they're harmless. They eat ants. Um, they're found in the really arid areas of Australia. Um, they do have this, like, it looks like an acorn. It's a pretend head. Um, we think as a biologist, they are thought to ward off predators. They move with these like slow jerky movements. Again, please go YouTube it, it's very cool. Um, but they live again in very arid areas and it's hard to get water. So they have special um, little channels between their scales that when uh, in the morning when the dew is around or they will rub up against a plant or a grass or something um, and it will channel and basically streamline that water right into their mouth. So it attracts um, these grooves attract water so that the animal can drink. They only lay about three to 10 eggs in a chamber underground. Um, and then they lap up their eggs with their really short sticky tongues. And that is not supposed to say eggs, that is supposed to say ants. So they have sticky tongues. I think that might be, oh, one more. All right, and then these guys, um, you might've heard of a Gila monster. Mexican beaded lizards are very similar to them. Both um, look very similar to each other found in kind of the same area, but they're both, both venomous. So um, when threatened, they will hiss, they'll open their mouths. Um, they may be venomous, but they do not bite unless they are really provoked. Like if you back them into a corner and you're gonna eat them, then yes, they will use their venom, but it's also very expensive to make that venom. Uh, these guys are important because the venom from these lizards is used in diabetes medication. So if you are someone that takes diabetes medication, or if you know of someone, it's a very, very common drug that, um, and helps with this. It's found in the, it's a compound component that's found in the venom of these animals. So um, they get fairly large, three feet. So ruler size or yardstick size here. Um, they search for food in trees on the ground. They eat things like nesting birds, eggs. Um, they have very, very hard scales. Um, if you look, especially on their head and on their upper body, they're uh, very bony like structures. They're called osteoderms. Um, the venom is produced in the glands in the lower jaw. It's used for defense. And then that venom actually travels along the groove teeth. So when they bite, they will like chew onto that person or onto that animal. And then um, that is how that venom is delivered then. 
I think that was it. Yeah. All right. It's a little bit longer today. Um, usually I only go about 45 minutes, but it's lizards and it's reptile month and there's just so much information. So um, next week, same time, 3 to 4 p.m. We have a whole season. We got five more weeks here. We got nocturnal animals. We have water birds, seeds and leaves, um, insect antenna, and then we're going to end in November with catfish. So lots of cool things to talk about the rest of the season. Um, I also, again, want to say that October is Nebraska Reptile Month. We have a lot of cool things happening, um, and I can put this in the email for all of you that registered today and are watching. We have... Um, a draw of reptile night, which we had last night. Um, we have a K through 12 art contest. So if you are someone in Nebraska who falls in that K through 12 category, um, we have that. We have a cool art contest. If you turn in an art competition um, of a native reptile, we'll send you some swag um, and you get entered in that contest. We have a nature nerd night coming up on the 17th with Dennis Ferraro and a couple other people that are herpetologists talking about turtles. Um, we have a statewide trivia night all about the ugly, unloved, and unseen animals um, happening on October 19th. And then if for you Lincoln folks, we have a huge uh, reptile event that's happening um, October 20th. It's a Thursday um, at Hardin Hall, which is 33rd and Holdridge. It's on East Campus. Um, I can put all this in the email, but live reptile displays, um, lots of fun, like family activities all about Nebraska native reptiles. So lots of things happening. If you want more, all of our science of are located on our Game and Parks Education YouTube channel. We have a Facebook page. We have an Instagram page. It is also Inktober. So for you all that like to draw out there, we have an Instagram initiative going on called Nebraska Inktober, where you have different prompts every day. And the idea is that you spend five minutes and draw something um, related to it. So yesterday was scale. So draw something that relates to scales. And then we also have our Nebraska Wildlife Education website where we have cool downloadable activities and lots of information on there as well. All right. Thank you, everyone. We will uh, see you next week for nocturnal animals. So same time, 3 to 4 p.m. Um, it is a specific YouTube or a Zoom link, and I will send that in the email that um, everyone gets if you're registered. So thank you. Um, we will check here to see if we have, I'm stop sharing. Okay, good. I was a little worried. I kept seeing my thing um, bleep here. So I was like worried I was talking to to nobody for 45 minutes. So, all right, who do we got here? Um, someone just said, thank you. Yes. So if you have any questions, I can stick around. Otherwise, thank you so much for um, joining us about lizards. Um, I'm really excited for nocturnal animals next week too. That's a wide variety of things. So we will um, talk about that. All right. Someone asked, what makes a skink a skink? Uh, so they're a little bit more heavy bodied than other lizards. Um, if you look at something like a Great Plains skink and like a prairie lizard, prairie lizards or lizards in general, um, non skinks, I guess, they're going to have a little bit slimmer of a body and they're also going to have a little bit more rough or keeled scales. Uh, skinks are going to be a little bit thicker bodied. They usually have a little bit more of a pointy mouth, but not always. And then they have really smooth scales on them. So um, thicker bodies are usually a little bit bigger, but it just depends. So good question. But they are in fact still lizards. They're just a type of lizard. So all right. Well thank you everyone. Um I'll let you guys go. I appreciate you coming at four o'clock or three o'clock on a Thursday. We will see you hopefully next week. So thank you everyone. Ooh, do lizards make good pets? Uh sometimes you have to get the right ones. You can actually have um blue tongue skinks they get rather large, so you just have to have a large tank. Um, but chameleons, I've had a chameleon before. I would not recommend a chameleon as like a beginner pet because they need a lot of humidity and light. Um, they're not as good as snakes. I think snakes are a good kind of starter reptile. Um, but once you get that, but bearded dragons are easy. Um, I know leopard geckos are pretty easy as well, and they're pretty um, they're pretty easy to take care of as well. Um, someone asked, uh, they just got here late. That's okay. Why is a legless lizard considered a lizard? Good question. Um, so one of those characteristics we mentioned at the very beginning is that what makes a lizard is that they usually have legs. Um, it's not always the case, obviously. Um, lizards are still in that separate order compared to snakes. Um, so even though they don't have legs, um, they still might have those external ear openings. They will have movable eyelids. Their body structure is going to be very different to that of a snake. Um, so even though they might look like a snake, they still have other characteristics that lets them fall within that um, 
that lizard category, if that makes sense. So good question. Goodness, good, good questions. Thank you. Yes. All right. Thank you, everyone. We will see you next week. Appreciate it. Have a good week.